And now we're going to get into it. You guys ready? Yeah. You work. You're so ready. The last one last thing I want to mention. There's a sign over there. We have two wonderful writers. We have so many wonderful writers in town, but we have two particularly wonderful writers, Chris Barton and Jennifer Ziegler, and they actually have a YouTube show that they do called This One's Dedicated To. And so our conversation tonight, we're going to touch on who you actually dedicate your books to. We're going to touch on a lot of stuff. But they have a whole series where they interview kid-lit authors about the person they actually put on that dedication page of the book. So we wanted to give them a shout out because it's a cool thing. I love what they're doing to support writers and also to have cool conversations about this topic. So check that out. There's a little QR code for you there. And now, I actually was not um, initially going to be moderating this panel, but I'm going to sit. And you are so lucky, because yes, I am going to moderate this panel. So I'm transitioning, <laughs> transitioning to my moderator seat. Um, so our, our panel tonight is dedicated, who we write for and why. What a big topic, right? Like we have the actual literal who's on that dedication page. But then we're also thinking about in the creative process, who are we writing for? Who's in our mind when we start a project? Who's in our mind as we continue with that project? And then later down the road in the publishing world, you hear words like audience, right? Market. So there's also that question of whether you're writing for them or not, who are those ultimate readers? That ideal reader, that imagined reader, and then the readers that maybe are going to be marketed to, right? So there's a lot to talk about. We're going to touch on as much of it as we can. But I'm also excited to just see where this conversation goes. So first, I'm happy to introduce our panelists. Starting right here to my left, Sasha West is the author of two books of poetry, the award-winning Failure and I Bury the Body, and most recently published on March 15th, 15th guys. This is Sasha's first event in person with this book, <laughs> the beautiful, beautiful How to Abandon Ship. Her multimedia eco-arts exhibits with visual artist Hollis Hammonds have been exhibited at the Columbus College of Art and Design, Texas A&M, Art Prize 2023 Michigan, and elsewhere. She is an associate professor of creative writing at St. Edward's U University, where she founded and runs the Environmental Humanities Program. Please welcome Sasha West. <laughs> to Sasha's left. Roger Reeves is the author of two award-winning poetry collections, King Me and Best Barbarian, and now the essay collection, the wonderful essay collection, Dark Days, Fugitive Essays. He's the recipient of a Whiting Award and fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts and the Radcliffe Institute at Harvard University. He teaches at the University of Texas at Austin, and we're so thrilled to have him here tonight. Please welcome Roger Reeves. Finally, Liz Barton Scanlon is the author of numerous beloved books for young people, including picture books, and middle grade novels, and soon a chapter book series. Her most recent picture book, which beats Sasha because it's actually not even officially on sale yet, um, but is here for you all tonight, is Everyone Starts Small, which is illustrated by Dominique Ramsey. Liz has taught at Austin Community College, The Writing Barn, The Writers League of Texas, and at countless schools and conferences. She currently serves on the faculty of the Writing for Children and Young Adults program at the Vermont College of Fine Arts, and lives here in Austin, Texas. Please welcome Liz Garden Stanley. <laughs> and also, I think for the first time in the history of literary events, three poets on a panel and it's March. It's not April. <laughs> it's March. Look at that, guys. <laughs> when you're going to talk about something like who we write for and why, you kind of gravitate to the poets. We're, we're pretty sure you guys are going to be fun to talk to about this. So I wanted to start with um, a literal interpretation of our topic. So if each of you could, just briefly, because these, these books are so wonderful, and I prefer that instead of me doing <laughs> doing a terrible job of summarizing them for this beautiful group, I'd love for each of you to just talk a little bit about the book in front of them. Tonight, we're gonna you are free to touch on your other work as well as you answer questions. We're gonna focus on these three for now. So if you could just take a, a beat, tell us a little bit, give us an introduction to the book, and then also truly read us that dedication page and tell us who the book is dedicated to Liz. Nope, Sasha, actually, I'm going to start right here with you, because you're right here next to me. 
because he just wanted to surprise me. Yeah. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. I said yes to this panel before I knew who was on it or what it was about. And it's just like, yes, that guy will do anything you want. And then right found out it was Roger and Liz. And I was like, oh, this is a dream team. And then found out it was about dedication. And it's really interesting. I, I, if you don't mind, I'm going to tell you a quick story about the dedication for the book, because this may be the only time I ever end up talking about it. Because it's usually a piece that people um, just kind of glance over. And obviously, it's important to me for sentimental reasons. But this dedication is um, particularly important, I think, to me for other ethical reasons. It was the very, very last piece of the book that was revised. Um, so this book is a book of poems about what it's like to live through the time of climate change, um, what it's like to try to look back to see where all of these things began, um, and what it's like to try to think forward. And in that, it's also a book about parenting and what it's like to be introducing your child to this world at this moment and helping them make their way through it. And so I knew from pretty early on that I wanted the dedication to be an intergenerational one. Um, I knew I wanted to dedicate it to my mom. And some of that is just, I mean, again, this is really personal, um, that she is, I, she's literally why I, why I exist, like why my cells are here. Um, but also, she's the person that introduced me to language, that introduced me to poetry and the power of poetry that showed me what it was like to be an artist in the world, that gave me belief in myself before I had it. And so for every way that I exist as a writer, I also owe that to her. Um, and certainly, I, I cared about climate change before writing this book, but um, there's something different about you know, knowing that, that I'm, I am beholden to an actual child and thinking about you know, what, are, what are the stories that we're learning together. And so for most of the life of the book until the very last sliver, the dedication was to the mother who made me a daughter and to the daughter who made me a mother. And then I was just incredibly, incredibly lucky that in that last little piece where I could make changes before the book went to print, our child told us that they were non-binary. And I went back through, and I thought a lot, because the book is, you know, there's a main narrator in the book who's sometimes Cassandra. Cassandra's daughter writes back. Cassandra's granddaughter writes back. A lot of it is thinking through the hierarchies of the world through gender. And the first thing I thought is, do I change the poems? And, um, and it was, I, I, that was actually really easy to answer, because when I say I and a poet, it's not, you know, it's not me. Like, it's a constructed self. The daughter in the book was not my child. And so it was like, those were fine. But the dedication needed to be accurate. And I spent a lot of time thinking about how to change it. Because you know it's so circular, and it's syntax, and so neat. And so I was trying to find something clever. And then I was trying to find something graceful. And then I was like, can I use it as a metaphor, use this moment as a metaphor for opening the world? And finally, I was just like, no, like all I need to do is change that word. And that there's something really, really important in that rupture. And I was thinking about, you know, my kids' choice, and I want to be really, I want to be really clear that I'm not saying their choice to be non-binary. That just is like that's a to be verb. That's a fact in the world. But their choice to be open about it right now in Texas is something else. And I started thinking intergenerational, intergenerationally in a different way. That the reason that they have the language for this, and the reason that they have models and culture because of the work that a lot of other people have done leading up to this, saying no, saying there's something more. And that their decision to live into the world and say, like, what we have been given is not enough and toxic and kind of like closes us down, um, that that's, you know, like, that that's doing something. And I had written this whole book thinking about how do we get out of these toxic cycles and so that the actual dedication is to the mother who made me a daughter, to the child who made me a mother. And for me, that very small syntactical rupture is like, that's, that's the hope. That's what's sending me back out into the world and into the next writing. Sasha, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Roger, I'm going to pass it to you now. 
So uh, my dedication is similar um, in the sense of it says for Naima, who's my daughter, because you must live here for now. And the epigraph to the book, which I think is important, because it speaks to the dedication, which is geography is fate. And that's Ralph Ellison riffing on an axiom of Heraclitus. Right. And so for me, my dedication is thinking about, and it connects with my book, uh, with, with what's the sort of, what the book does, which is think through uh, many different things. But what else, I'll, I'll leave you, I'll start with a story as well. So it's 2020, we're in the pandemic, right? Austin, Texas, which isn't being hit terribly in the same way that I had a friend who left uh, Brooklyn in March of 2020 to come and live with us because it was so hellacious in New York City. And so it's 20, so as you know, the pandemic is sort of leisurely happening for us here in Austin uh, before it sort of increases. Uh, just as that is happening, right, we have uh, we'll say the George Floyd moment. And, uh, you know, that moment for black families is a, is a moment that we experience cyclically, right, throughout our lives, right? Like I remember Rodney King when I was 12 years old, right? I can remember Mike Brown in 2014, right? These, these sorts of cycles always happen, but this is the first time the cycle had happened and I had a child. One of the things that is, you have to know about me too, is that my child by the age of one had been to 12 to 14 protests already. <laughs> but these protests were a little different than the ones she had been to in Chicago. Even we went to the Trump rally, to the, to the rally outside of Trump uh, trying to come to Chicago. I don't know if you remember, heard about this rally here in Austin, but I was teaching at the University of Illinois Chicago, and it turned into a fight. And my daughter was there, I had this really interesting experience with her as being a child amongst all that sort of hatred of black people. Uh, it was really interesting to watch uh, the shame, particularly of women that were mothers at this. When they would see me with my daughter, they would have their Trump signs and they would fold them. Oh, wow. It's an important lesson. Yeah. It's a really important <laughs> lesson, y'all. This is what the civil rights movement understood. Shame works. Oh. But I digress. So we get back, so it's 2020, and we're trying to decide, my partner and I, if we're gonna take her to these protests that are happening in Austin, because we see, you know, we see what's happening, the police are, they're violently responding. And it became sort of a hobby. I, I was I was trying to figure this out because I, have, I write about this in this book, which is, I don't know if there's really safety in the world. I don't know if children really have that option. When I think about children in Gaza right now, right? So one of the things that I thought about was, okay, how do I take her? Because I think that to some degree she has to encounter this. She's four, but she has to encounter this, right? Um, and so we decide to take her. And so we take her to several of the rallies. We try to make sure Right, we keep her on the edges, but I wanted her to see this. I wanted her to have this experience of what it is to be a black child in America and a black person. I'm not gonna shield you from the bullshit, right? You need to be ready for this because my mother didn't shield me when I was six, right? And so this book really comes out of this moment afterwards when we are, after they painted black Austin matters in the streets and things like that, and she's playing in it, and she's still hearing the sirens. One day we are, it was July of 2020, and she's playing outside, she's playing in a bush, she's looking at a bird's nest, and she hears a police siren. And she says, Daddy, are the cops coming to kill us? And I was like, I answered truthfully. I said, I don't know. I can't say no, because I don't know if they are or not. And so this book, in some ways, is me writing to her now, but also writing to her in the future when she's trying to figure out how to grapple with the difficulty of being black in America, because it's not going to change. The world isn't getting more silent and less dangerous. It's becoming more dangerous and louder. 
But I, what I wanted to, what I write about in this book is even in the middle of what feels like disaster, how do we eke out moments of joy, moments of pleasure? Can our protests be pleasure? Right? I think about sort of the different protest traditions of dancing as one protest, right? singing as one protest. Right, because we're here to buoy up the spirit, right? I think about in Atlanta, there were people dancing even as the police were coming for them. And so I wanted to write a book for sort of her, but also for me as a way of saying, hey, this is keep joy in the front of this. Even as we're facing what seems like sometimes certain death, we still must go about sort of living with that same amount of joy, with that we're going into the we're going into protest, not heavy, but we're going into the protest with a sense of what we're fighting for is our lives and the beauty of our lives. So let's go. And so that's why this book is dedicated, because she might decide, as I might decide, to become an expatriate one day. This might get too heavy. So it's for Naima who must live here for now. <laughs> Roger. Liz? Yes, gosh, that's, um, both of those stories are so beautiful, and this is one of the things I love about panels, is how there's always these sort of accidental overlaps, um, and I just kept wanting to think, <gasps> as, as both of you were talking, um, <laughs> one, just the, the whole discussion around climate. I have a I have a good friend, about half of my books are what a good friend of mine describes as outside books. Um, and they're just my expression of kind of the awe of the natural world, um, which is the flip side of the climate discussion, right? Is, is what it is that is here that we love. Um, and, and it makes me think about going to these protests and and trying to find joy in there. When, when you're tasked with writing for young people, um, even if there isn't joy, there has to be hope, because otherwise you're, you're abandoning your readers. Um, and I sometimes talk to my students about writing not happily ever after, but hopefully ever after. So this is one of my outside books. Everyone starts small, it comes out next week, but because of the time warp that is book people, it's actually out right now. Um, and it is a story that includes no human characters, this book. It is a story about um, all the other living beings the trees and the bugs and the water and the um, the things that we're around every day that um, are growing and interacting and connecting. I became really obsessed with um, all of the things that happen underground in the networks of communication and connection, which is kind of where this book started. Um, and so that's really what the book is about is is both honoring sort of these awesome living things in the world and also their resilience and connection and communication that we think we've got um, sort of a, a tag on as humans, but it isn't true. It's, um, there's a lot happening in the other realms. And this book, and that, again, another echo, this book isn't echo, or, uh, dedicated to my children because I've dedicated too many books to them. <laughs> um, they're a little older now. But it is, the, so the title is called Everyone Starts Small. And when my, I have two girls and they're um, in their 20s and they also have inherited this very challenging situation that we find ourselves in. And when my kids were growing up, there was a family that we met that was like our matching family with kids the same age, um, a block and a half away. And it's just one of those things, had we lived three other blocks away, our whole life would have been different. 
And so this um, book is dedicated, is said, the dedication is for the Lundwick family who started small with us. Um, so it is also kind of from our daughters, even though they have too many books. <laughs> Thank you, Liz. Thank you so much. And I'm going to stick with you because I want to talk, and what, again, what beautiful stories. Seriously, and, and to start at this place, I think is so cool because what you said, Sasha, we don't ask that question very often, right? You don't hear that very often as a writer. Tell me about who you dedicated this book to and why. So I feel really lucky to be here and hear each of you answer that. But I want to talk about as you're starting a project, um, when you start to think about who is going to read that project, who's going to read that ultimate book, who's going to read, you can also you want to pare it down and say who's going to read this poem that I'm going to put out into the world, but when the reader becomes, starts to take shape for you, and what, what that looks like for you. And I want to start with you, Liz, with an even more specific question, because writing Kidlet, I imagine, too, you're thinking about multiple readers, because you're thinking about the age group, the children, but you're also thinking about the person who's going to actually walk into the store, pull the money out and buy the book, which is often the parent, and then also, and you know, bless book people and the work they are doing to make sure that books, all books are in schools, but the teachers who are going to, and the librarians in the schools, and bless them too, because they're doing amazing work, and, and especially here right now, um, who are going to read those books to kids as well. So can you start with that, how the reader takes shape for you, and also that sort of um, relationship between those three different types of readers? Yes. Um, well, the first answer is easy for me, which is that the reader doesn't take shape until I'm really revising a piece. When I'm when I'm drafting, I'm kind of lost in my own little world. Um, I am a very sort of muse-driven, intuitive writer, so I don't sit down with a plan. Um, unfortunately, I'm kind of jealous of that ability. So I just sort of stay in a swirly place for quite a while. And um, I wouldn't impose that on any of my readers. So they stay out. <laughs> um, usually when once I'm revising, I start thinking about them a lot, partly because of age. So when you're writing for adults, um, it might not matter so much if your reader is 32 or 47, but the difference between three and 11 is tremendous, and in fact is a whole different category. So one of the reasons that I start thinking about the audience is to try to figure out what the form is. Is it, is it gonna be a picture book or a chapter book or a middle grade novel? Um, and usually the story reveals itself in some way. Um, so there's that, and then as you were talking about, there's the folks who we tend to call the gatekeepers. Um, we appreciate them, but um, they're, they're the, the door through which we have to carry the book to get them to the actual audience, which are the young people. Um, right now, those gatekeepers are under intense fire, and if anyone can show up at a school board meeting in the state of Texas and speak up on behalf of the freedom to read, that would be fantastic. Um, so with picture books, they actually have dual readership, which is that picture books are written, um, are intended to be read aloud to pre and early readers. So there, there is going to be an adult there, but they're really for the young people. But sometimes you throw the adult a bone and give them like <laughs> a little joke or um, a little vocabulary that they're going to have to contextualize for the kids. Um, I tend not to think that much about the booksellers and the teachers and the librarians um, because I want them to get the books to the kids, and I trust that they will, and I love and admire their work, but I think they're actually doing the same work that I'm doing, which is trying, trying to get the right book 
in the hand of the kids who need them. So when I'm writing a book like this, I'm thinking about kids in general, kids even more specifically who might be between two and eight. And then I don't know which kids it's going to land with. And I'm fine with that. It may be read to a group in, in a school library, and some of the kids are going to love it, and some are going to wander off. Um, and then certain families are going to buy it, partly because of what they see on the cover. Um, the illustrations speak very potently in picture books. Um, in fact, the, the kids of this audience tend to read the pictures while their parents are reading the words. Um, so the specific <coughs> child who's the audience, I don't know unless a, a parent tells me someday. And um, that's a great delight. Thank you. Just learned a lot about the picture book world. Appreciate it. Um, so Roger, same question for you. When you sit down to write, are you thinking, I have a feeling it's going to be a similar answer to, from all of you about how important the reader is from the start, but I'd love to hear where the reader starts to factor in. And then for you, I'd also love to hear the perspective on um, poetry with a reader in mind versus essays with a reader in mind. And even that, you know, this world that has become much more um, democratic, for lack of a better way of saying it, of journals and publications where it used to truly be it seemed that you were in a print publication that maybe had X number of readers, whereas now we can find poetry, we can find essays in such a wider um, space. So where does the reader start to um, enter when you're thinking about that as well? Journals you might publish with or what outlets you're gonna send your work to? So I always say my first reader is myself. I first have to please myself. I first have to engage the questions, the vulnerability, the fear, right? Like I'm writing, I always say I write at the edge of myself. I write at the edge of what I know. Um, partly because I, 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 there's this adage by Robert Frost that I love, right? That no surprise for the writer, no surprise for the reader. No tears for the writer, no tears for the reader. So, I know that if I can sort of inspire, whatever I inspire in myself, if I'm bored while I'm writing, my reader will be bored, <laughs> right? And so for me, when I'm writing a poem, particularly, I think because I've been, I've sort of been public with poetry more than I've been public with essays, though I've been writing them about the same amount of sort of length of time, I'm not really thinking about an audience particularly with poetry. I'm really trying to write a poem that sort of sends me into a new way of seeing or knowing. And I know if I do that, someone else will feel that. That may confuse others, right? But one of the things about poetry that I think is, I think this about all reading, which is reading is, re I think one of the things we have, I, I teach my daughter this, that reading is rereading. The first read is not actually reading. You haven't started reading until the fourth or fifth read, let's say. If you went into reading that way, then a lot of things wouldn't be that difficult, actually, right? And so, for me, that's the way I think about writing, right? Like, I think about it that way. So with poetry, um, when it comes to audience, um, I think that, I, I never, how do I say, I never thought I would ever have a book of poetry. The reason is, when I, when I decided I wanted to be a poet, Black poets weren't being published at the rate they're being published now. <coughs> in 2000, if you go back and look at, there's really there's a, there's really good statistics of seeing how many black books of poetry were published year by year by year. You'll notice a really large jump post 2014. You can go back to 2006 and see maybe eight books. So in 2000, I became a poet because I love poetry. I love writing poetry. I never, I was like, they don't publish black books, so that's not why I got into this. Right? I got into it because I was trying to make beauty. And I wanted to sort of just render the world and play with beauty and play. Right? It's kind of the way kids like play tag. 
they don't play tag to be recorded, they play tag because they enjoy it. So when I come to thinking about poetry, I'm not really thinking about audience in that way. Um, partly because I think that like, how do I say, if I think about audience, I think ultimately it becomes a little uh, paternalistic. Because what winds up happening, particularly in the spaces in which I'm a poet, sometimes we start to, what is accessible to the audience? And I just disagree with this whole accessibility bullshit conversation. Because my grandmother is someone who I can give her poems by Byron and Shelley. And she never went to college until she was, she, she didn't go to college until after I was born. Right? She grew up reading the King James Version of the Bible. That was her school textbook in South Carolina when she was a sharecropper. I'm not going to circumscribe what I believe people are capable of reading. I always say, I was telling my partner this, when I teach, I teach to where people are at. When I write, I write to where they're going. Mm -hmm. right? Like I think that's the way I think about audience. Now, the challenge of dark days, and I'm gonna tell you this right off the, I, we are in a storytelling period such that I think we've taken stories rigor for granted. Um, and I wanted to see if we could bring back the era of great criticism, where Americans would sit with a critical essay and deal with it, and deal with the sort of questions and thoughts in the essay. Baldwin did this for us. Right? Susan Sontag, Lionel Trilling, Gore Vidal. Right? I feel like we've lost this critical tradition because everybody's like, just tell me a story. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, stories are cool. Stories are great. But what we need is a critical public. And so what I was trying to do in this book was actually like be like, Americans, we're intelligent, and I'm going to believe that we want critical essays that are asking us to think about what is the future of our democracy and what is the future of us, right? And I don't have to couch it in like a story. Because some things have to be said boldly, and some things have to be said in a way that's like, I need you to think about X, Y, and Z, like empathy, right? And the limits of empathy. Right now, everybody wants to talk about empathy, but if empathy stopped genocide, we wouldn't be where we're at. So other things have to happen alongside empathy. Right? So when I'm thinking about audience, I'm thinking that way. In terms of where I publish, I always get the advice I was always given, which I thought was the best advice ever about publishing your work, which is send your work where you want it, where you want to see it. Where do you want to be published? Doesn't matter if they publish work like you. Where do you want it? And I, so that's what I do. I want to work in the New Yorker, I send it to the New Yorker. Mm -hmm. right, I want to work in the New York Times, I send it to the New York Times. It doesn't mean I have to accept it, but that's where I want my work. So I send work. So I don't, I don't try to like figure out what the aesthetic is, because ultimately when I read stuff in journals or in literary magazines, it doesn't look like what I'm writing. Like I, there, I can't think of many places where I've seen, oh yeah, they'll, they'll like my stuff here. It's generally like. I don't feel like they'll like my stuff here. If I, you know, so I just publish it. Marie Howe, she's a poet, she said that once in a workshop and I totally appreciate her saying that. She said, just send your work wherever you want to see it. Don't worry about if they publish people like you that look like you, that have your name, send it out. And I think that's the best way to think about getting your work in the world. I love that advice, thank you. Sasha, where in the process, the creative you know, start to something, are you thinking about the reader? And uh, I also want to talk to you about you know, one thing that I think we, um, when I worked in publishing, when I was an agent, um, when I look at query letters, sometimes as writers, we might say, this book is for everyone, right? And then one of the first things you might say if you were, were helping someone with their query letter is, well, let's, like, speak, let's narrow that down a little bit. Books aren't necessarily for everyone which is terrible advice now that I think about it, but um, <laughs> what I'm trying to say is this. I think you're, there's such an urgency to this and such a um, almost, you know, I think Sarah, who was who, our program director, who was preparing for this panel said this almost existential crisis that you're approaching in this collection and it feels like a collection that is truly for everybody, right? That breaks that rule. So where, where did you start to think about who the readers were and how did you initially engage with that idea of who is this book for um, as you, if you did it all as you were writing? Yeah. 
First of all, I'm going to quote you on that. This book is for everyone. Becca Oliver said so. Um, second of all, there's a way that I could say ditto to what Liz and Roger have said, that there's sort of there's this space at the beginning that really is, this is hard in the world. I don't understand this. I want to know more. I am unsure. I'm trying to make patterns. And so that beginning part, I mean, the reason that I'm a writer is because it helps me live. Like, it helps me encounter things and map them out in some way. And so that early, like what you were talking about with the swirl or that sort of trying to surprise yourself, that's what drives me into the work and what keeps me there. And then um, speaking about the messy middle, if you're looking to the, the class um, that Choichi's uh, teaching this, this weekend, the middle is where I have written something and I'm trying to figure out what is this work and what does it want to be and how do I become the person that can make it? And sometimes that's a matter of craft, and sometimes it's a matter of reading more or having more conversations. Or Roger, I've heard you talk about too that there are times where you just have to live more to be able to do what the poem needs you to do. And so that middle, it's like it's a lot of questions and it's a lot of returning to it. And I need to be able to say at the end, this is what the work wants to be, and this is when I know I've gotten there. Because I mean, like that's you have to be able to know that to know when you're done revising. And then there's the process of revision where I start thinking about the audience. And it's interesting because like we were talking, you were saying accessibility. And I think, well, there are some ways that I'm trying to open up the poems to people that don't read poetry regularly. But there are other times that I'm trying to open up the poems to people that if they don't see the poem performing a certain kind of experimental thing, like they're going to zone out, that there's so many needs that readers have. And that what I want to do is like I don't I don't know who the poem is going to speak to. I'm going to try to make the aperture as wide as I can, but I'm not going to do anything that changes the heart of what the poem is. And that's why I have to know what it is so well <coughs> before I begin thinking about the reader. I can't think about the exact reader because you I don't know who you are. You know, like some of you I do, but it's probably because you're my friends and you're. Buy my book, whether you like it or not, you know? and so that's that's not the real revision process. Um, and I think in this, I mean, if it if it if it is a book for everybody, which like that would be lovely. Um, it's because we're all living in this world together, and I would say that this um, that the book wrestles a lot with what we am I inside of. You know, when I say we, who are we? How big is that group? And I think the thing that is unique for us in the U.S is that we are both victim and perpetrator of this in different ways. And that we're living through this time that our storms look different, our vulnerabilities look different, how we entered this looks different, how much control we have over it looks different. But there was some um, really interesting statistic where it's like the top 1% of people in the world are responsible for 25% of climate change, uh, sorry, of greenhouse gases, the top 10% are responsible for 50%. And I hear that, and I hear the top 1%, and I'm like, well, yeah, y'all, with your 500-foot yachts and your private jets, like, of course, you're the problem. Um, and then, but what's interesting in the US, because this is a global, a global statistic, is that the top 1% is $100,000. I'm not in the top 1%, but I know a lot of people who are. If you're making 100000 a year, globally, you are in the top 1%. If you're making 40,000 a year, you're in the top 10%. And so what looks to us like a middle class life, or even, you know, I think now the Austin low income for certain housing is 64,000 a year. Like actually, we're sort of in the middle of this. And how do we live with, how do we live with that? How do we live with that cognitive dissonance? How do we grieve and change and story make around that? Um, yeah, so I don't I don't know who this will speak to. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of parenting in the book, but I certainly have had readers who are not parents, and I think you know even if you haven't had a child, you're thinking about what do you want to keep and what do you want to talk about with people and what are your values and and what do you hand down. Um, but I can't know. Like you, there's that great W. S. Merwin poem where he's talking to Berryman when he's a young. Um, he's talking to Berryman when Merwin is a young writer, and he's saying, "How do you know if what you've written is ever any good?" And Berryman says, you can't, you never know, you die without knowing, if you have to know, don't write. 
And it's like on one hand, you know, yeah, don't don't get into it to be famous or to be liked. But on the other hand, it's we don't know what part we play. Like we are not we are not savior. We are ecosystem. And I don't know what other minds my work might be symbiotic with. And I just can do, you know, I do what I do to open it up and invite people in. And then I just have to step aside and let the world do what it does. I think one of the things, and I think we would all sort of have some version of this, is our first sort of allegiance is to the, to the thing we're making. Right? We have to allow whatever we're making to be its best. And sometimes that's going to be scary for us because we can imagine a perceived audience that wouldn't want to receive what we're making. However, I do believe sort of we surprise ourselves when we sort of allow the thing we're making, when we attend to it, and allow it to be fully itself, it actually can imagine. Sometimes the thing we're we're making actually is larger in imagination than we are than we are ourselves. And so when that happens, sometimes the work surprises us. Like when fifteen year old kids come up to me like, "Yo, I read that poem and I liked it." That that changes. Like I'll I'll never forget at a reading, keep, not here book people, but at Resistencia. Fifteen year old boy came up to me and it changed my way of thinking about what my poems, who my poems were for, whether they were elitist or not. Right? I'm like, if a fifteen year old kid is like, yo, I'm feeling this, a fifteen year old white kid comes up to me is like, I'm feeling these poems. All right. Right? Clearly these poems have a larger reach than than what I thought they were doing. Right? So that's the thing I think in terms of audience, right? We first want to make the best thing we can make, because that's actually caring for and anticipating the audience that's going to read. Whoever it is. Yeah, for sure, because I, and, and maybe this is part of what you're going to say, but I wanted to ask that question as well, if anyone, and I love that you brought that up, if there were some surprises to you about who your work was resonating with that you hadn't expected. I don't know if this is what you're, you're talking about, but I just want to jump in quickly, and then I'm going to hand it to Liz, because I was thinking when you were, when you were talking, I remember reading, uh, is it All the World, that book, with my child, and I remember feeling like a deep wonder about how you are connecting things and this kind of like fierce and gentle curiosity with which you're looking at the world and I mean it was a book we read over and I mean it's part of why when I was saying this is a dream team panel like it was not just oh I, you know other writers I mean for both of both of your work has meant something to me and I I remember the physical feeling of reading that book even though you know we didn't know each other before today you were not thinking about me <laughs> no, no, Sasha, but deep down. <laughs> I'm pretty you sure book people Becca has that book, by yeah. the way. Yes. I, so. I just want to say that thinking about both of those, um, the way that now we're kind of circling around the responses, there's, there's the making the very best thing we can, and then there's the acknowledgement that the audience who we're supposedly writing for are are not actually just an audience, they're participants. Mm -hmm. And so the book is different. It, all the world is different for you and your child than it might have been in a, in a different, than it might have been at your house. And it's supposed to be that way. I think that's so funny when people say that you shouldn't send your work to like the New Yorker if your poems don't look like New Yorker poems because how boring. Yeah. Like why do we want all the poems in the New Yorker to be the same? Right. <laughs> but, 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 so it's this whole idea that who, wherever it lands, it's going to become a different thing. Which is the goal, I think. Then it's not, not ours anymore. Go ahead, go ahead. No, I, I love this because I was just talking with a graduate student today. And she's writing about sort of improvisation. And I was talking about improvisation in terms of jazz musicians talk about this, or jazz theorists of improvisation talk about this thing called co-performativity. So what is co-performativity? You have the bandstand, right? And the jazz musicians are playing and they're soloing, but they're looking into the audience. And whatever, if the audience is feeling a certain type of soloing, they're gonna dig deeper into that, right? So the audience is another person in the band, right? Making the sort of possibility of the song, right? That's the, what the reader is always doing. Right, the reader, like, the, this is not a book if no one reads it, right? So there's a way in which there's a co-performativity and we can't circumscribe that as writers. 
what that performance or what that reading experience will be. Yeah. You have something to say, Sasha? Is that okay? I thought you'd ask this question. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, so, so going back to the original question, I think the biggest surprise, and this is similar to yours, is that um, one of the people that blurbed my book, Carrie Fountain, has a kid who's like a year or two older than mine, and apparently my manuscript was sitting on Carrie's desk, and then she was like, who is this Sasha West? I, can I keep this book? <laughs> I was like, oh, I didn't, I wasn't, I wasn't thinking that I was writing for middle grade, but apparently maybe I was. I'm like, it, it's dark, but it's also very true. <laughs> and yeah, and then building on that sort of thinking about what audience is, um, Muriel Rukeyser says something great about this, and but I, there's something similar that a publisher, Matthew Stadler, says, which is publication is not the making of an object, but the making of a public. Like it is a creation of a public. It's us being together. Like these are just these are artifacts, y'all. But the living thing is what happens when you're reading, what happens when you're talking about it, um, what happens when you're sharing something that you loved with friends. Uh, yeah, so that's, and that's where it's at, and I, I really, I've been leaning into that, because I will say the weird thing about having this book officially out for four, four days, seven days, whatever it's been, eight days, six days, time <laughs> is weird, um, yeah, so for six days is, it is really weird to write like an anti-capitalist, anti-consumerist, anti-extraction book, and then be like, hey, buy it. <laughs> and so I've really, I've been trying to lean into that, that the value of this is in what we can say to each other and what comes out of it. And just buy it at an indie bookstore, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Roger, did you want to add something? I love this idea of publics because I, I have to say the sort of social mediafication has sort of theorized public, but it does not actually, I think, enact publics in the way that we, to me, this right here is what we need, mm. right, which is to be together having these ideas passed between us. These are the publics that books create, right, and I'm sure, yes, they happen on Zoom, and they can happen in this sort of social media fear, but we actually need to sit down and commune with each other like this, right? And the book is the opportunity. These books were the opportunity to be in communion with each other, right? And so I just love this idea of publics. That's what we're making, is publics. Well, you can come back and be in publics with us any time <laughs> you want. Uh, so let me ask you each one uh, last question. Our wonderful intern, Tamara, I think is asking some folks, has been asking some folks, <laughs> Um, in the audience's question, but I'm just wondering, let's talk about you each as a reader. Um, what is a book, can you share with us, and it's gonna put so much pressure on Sasha, but then it's gonna be a little easier for Roger and a little easier for Liz, because we're gonna start over here. Can you share with us a book that you read and you said, this book was written for me? For giving, having that experience as a reader, and maybe give us a little, more on what that book is, why you felt that way, and then of course we're going to encourage everyone in the audience to go to the bookshelf and buy that book tonight um, during the day of sales. But yeah, can you start, Sasha, we'll start with you. What's a book that you just got that great feeling of, yes, this was written for me? Okay, that's really, it's really hard to choose. <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm going to go with, um, I'm going to go with a new book of essays called Thin Skin by Jen Shapland. Um, she's an amazing writer. You two were in conversation at the Texas Book Festival. I loved her first book, an autobiography of Carson McCullers. I love her mind. And about 10 years ago, she moved from Austin to Santa Fe, which is where I grew up. And she wrote um, her book of essay, Thin Skin, is about her, um, like her embodied sense of sort of being in the world and literally having thin skin and thinking about like toxicity and what, what are we taking in and family history, but it's also really a book about what it's like to live in Santa Fe, which is this incredibly beautiful place with this very clear air that has these incredibly entangled toxic histories with um, the atomic testing and how native peoples in New Mexico have been treated and water rights and I mean it's just like it's a really it's it's a place that it's interesting to be from because when I was growing up there even though obvious I, well people when I was growing up there people when I said I was from New Mexico used to say are you a citizen 
And I was like, first of all, how did you learn U.S. history? And that used to be so annoying to me. But then actually, I'm like, you know, there's something there that especially when I was there, I was there like a little as the sort of Santa Fe thing was starting. Um, but that's a place where people have very deep roots and where you literally are driving by lava fields. So ba both in the geography and the culture, there's just these like intense strata and intense power plays. And to get to see a writer whose mind I love work through that geography as a newcomer and all that history, I just felt like, oh, this is the book that I have been waiting for for decades. So what I'm gonna do is not, I'm not, no, I'm not, I'm not going to cheat. I'm going to, I'm going to adhere to the your question. book? No, not at all. Because there were so many writers that I thought of immediately. Uh, Toni Morrison has that moment in, I think it's Beloved, or is it Jazz, where she says, um, one of the characters says, I think it's Beloved, she's a friend of my mind, right? Um, and so I'm going to suggest this book, Bewilderment by a poet named David Ferry, who just died uh, in November at 99. We just had his memorial on his 100th birthday, which was this past Saturday in Boston. Um, and the reason I'm suggesting David's book is because I met him when he was 92, and we became friends. And it's the most unlikely of friendships, and it was a really, it's the, it's my oldest friend I've ever had. And he was so, we were so alike. And his spirit was so strong, and he was so young, right? Even as he was like losing his sight. And so Bewilderment was a book I had actually read 10 years before I had ever met him. And I remember getting the book at Book People when I was a grad student. And opening it up and being like, oh my God, how come I've never heard this poet David Ferry before this? He's translated the Aeneid. He translated the most famous, probably, translation of Gilgamesh. Right? Um, he translated Virgil's Odes. But this is what's really crazy. He had only two books of poetry up to 65. He wrote most of his books of poetry after 65, after he retired, which I think is such a testament. Right? And we need to sort of really think about that, that sometimes your best books come after 65. Right? So David Ferry. Bewilderment. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Thank you, Roger. Liz, how about you? Bring us home here. Oh, what I book? can't believe neither of you did cheat, so that means I can't either. Because that is such a hard question. Just like books start racing into your head. We're the Writers League of Texas. We're going to ask the easy questions. We're going to ask the fun questions. We're going to ask the and tough then, questions. And then at the end. I am going to actually mention a classic, and it's going to be a children's book just because um, that's mostly what I write. And also, I think it was the first time as a kid that I felt something that I have felt in many, many, many books since then, which is this possibility to have a piece of art that is both full of love and grief or joy and suffering um, at the same time, which to me is just a miracle, but also is what it is to be human every day. Um, and so for me, that very first book was Charlotte's Web. And the reason that it is on the tip of my tongue is because I just this fall heard the audiobook of E.B. White reading it. And if you haven't, you should maybe like go home and listen to it tonight because it is a beautiful experience um, to hear it in his own voice and he reads it slowly and it is, you know how so often when you revisit things they don't hold up and it do, it's just word perfect in terms of what it says about family and love and friendship and art, really, all of it. That's some big. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. So, wow. I feel like this has been 
It's been a real honor to sit here and chat with you three. And what a special program to really hear you dig into not only, I mean, those beautiful stories we started with about who you dedicated your books to, but how you think about the reader, how you think about experiences like this, and to hear you not only talk about your own work, which is wonderful, you guys. You are gonna wanna walk away from tonight with some books from our panelists, but also what a pleasure to hear you share your generosity and your enthusiasm and your excitement for the writers who also inspire you, which I think is just beautiful. Um, so I wanna thank you, and I wanna say a big thank you to everyone here. What we do for these panel discussions is we don't take questions from the audience because we want to encourage you. The books are all downstairs by the information table. If you haven't picked up a book yet, I would encourage you to go downstairs, buy some books. you got to buy them first before they get signed. And then come back up here because our panelists, I didn't mention this part, but they're going to stick around and uh, say hello to you, sign some books. Um, we're going to stick around. We hope you'll all stick around and get to meet some other writers in the audience tonight, other folks who are here. But a big, big, big thank you first to Book People for being amazing, amazing uh, host venue tonight. A big thank you to the folks who are joining us on YouTube and to Evan for being such a great host on our YouTube channel tonight and to our staff for the Writers League are here. And I also want to, again, mention the day of sales. It is really meaningful to the nonprofits in this town that Book People does that. And I can tell you, it's not easy being an arts nonprofit coming out of a pandemic. So if you have the ability to spend some dollars tonight and support the Writers League, and if you have the ability to also in turn be supporting this wonderful bookstore and these amazing, amazing writers, I hope you will. So please consider picking up some books tonight. But last and not least, thank you so much to our panelists, Sasha West, Roger Reeves, Liz Garden Scanlon. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much for coming. Thank <laughs> you.